Good evening. I'm Mike Perham, the president of the Army Heritage Center Foundation. The foundation is the friends group for the U.S. Army Heritage Education Center, a component of the Army War College and the Army's premier research facility on the history and heritage of the U.S. Army. Tonight, we're very pleased to have Dr. William Meadows. Dr. Meadows holds a BA from Indiana University and a double major anthropology and history and an MA and PhD degree in cultural anthropology from the University of Oklahoma. He has performed field work and published in the subfield of cultural anthropology, linguistic anthropology, and archaeology. He has conducted research with many Native American nations, as well in Japan, and has carried out archaeological field work in the Midwestern United States. Dr. Meadows has taught at Colorado State University, Indiana State University, and since 2003, Missouri State University. He is the author of six books, five which focus on Native American veterans and has published articles on Native American veterans, code talkers, and plain Indian maps, plain Indian ledger art, language, and other subjects. In 2004, he testified before a Congressional Senate hearing on the role of Native American code talkers in the United States Armed Forces. His testimony and research were seminal in the passage of the 2008 Code Talkers Recognition Act, Public Law 110-420, which brought federal recognition and a congressional goal and silver medal for all Native American code talkers. Dr. Meadow researches uh, and teaches several courses on Native American culture, world culture, cultural anthropology, people and cultures of Japan, ethno history, and ethnographic fields school, and of course, Native American toad talking. He's the head of the Missouri State Native American Studies Committee, and he comes from a family of very many veterans. I didn't list the books. They'll be on the uh, website when I publish the, uh, uh, the talk here in the next day or so. I'd ask you to hold your questions and answers to the end. Uh, and now, Dr. Meadows, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Uh, first, I want to thank Mr. Perry for, for inviting me uh, to speak to you tonight. And thank you all for uh, tuning in. And I hope you will enjoy the program. Um, so this is just to start off with this uh, slide here a little bit. Uh, we have a couple of paintings. There's the uh, red, white, and blue one in the corner there is a Choctaw painting. And the other one uh, in the field there is a uh, Cherokee painting. But these are both recent paintings of, uh, of uh, in interpretations of code talkers in action. And then the middle is a um, Eagle Scout project that a uh, museum down in Texas did on the Comanche code talkers and everything. So with that, I'm going to start uh, telling you a little bit about uh, Native American code talkers in World War I. Um, the first thing I always do briefly is I acknowledge this man here. This is uh, Forrest Castavoid. Uh, he was a World War II uh, Comanche code talker. And it was during my dissertation work down in Oklahoma, like most people, I, I had heard about the Navajos, of course, uh, but didn't know about all these other groups. And I, I met Forrest when I was working on my dissertation, which had to do with um, contemporary uh, Plains Indians veterans organizations. So particularly among the Kiowa, the Comanche and the Apache. And while doing an interview with Mr. Castavoid here, um, I discovered that he was one of 17 Comanches that were recruited about a year before Pearl Harbor and uh, uh, specifically to train and, and devise a code to prepare for World War II. So um, he encouraged me to pursue that. There were other uh, members of the World War II group alive and their training officers. So I pursued that and that actually became my second book, uh, which led me into my uh, subsequent work that I'm still doing with Code Talker. So my hat is always off to him because he, uh, if not for him, I might not have went down this road. And it is a uh, uh, one of the most enjoyable roads in my life that I've taken and it's still ongoing uh, with the work that I do. Um, so we're going to just, just a little bit of, uh, of uh, background here. And of course, I I'm sure a lot of the uh, listeners are um, uh, have some history in military things in World War One, and and uh, but uh, World War One, World War One, of course, for the United States gets in it a little bit later. We are uh, sending a lot of supplies to our allies, but it's not until the spring of '17 that we get in it, and a lot of our troops uh, do not really actively. Uh, get in combat until very late in 17, then primarily 18. Um, the conditions we know, of course, it is a, um, um, as all warfare has, but dreadful field conditions and everything. But this is primarily up to this time, a, a, a trench warfare operation, uh, very harsh conditions, particularly for the allies who are mostly living out in the open and everything. 
Uh, Germans, on the other hand, not all of them, but many of them had dugouts, which were these large cavernous uh, underground quarters that you'll see in a minute. And so uh, they could get out of some of the weather and a lot of the uh, inclement, inclement weather and have quite nice uh, conditions part of the time there. Um, this is warfare that has a lot of um, you know, stalemated lines across from each other, no man's land, trying to do these mash rushes and go over the top and take uh, other heavily defended uh, positions across an area and everything. So the area between them oftentimes called no man's land separating them. And of course, this is a war that, you know, in hindsight produced great casualties because it was still being fought primarily with kind of European tactics um, of two armies on big open fields primarily. Uh, going at it and um, um, the use of trenches and everything. Um, technologically, World War I is interesting because there's a lot of things that were first used in this period. Um, so the use of poison gas, uh, very widespread machine guns on a, on a scale larger than ever before, uh, the introduction of flamethrowers, uh, tanks, uh, airplanes, even though they're uh, fairly simple compared to what we will have later, but still uh, very effective for reconnaissance and some um, uh, some uh, bombing and things of that nature. The nature of the war early on, of course, is a lot of stalemated, uh, stalemated trench warfare. But in 1918, as the Allies are uh, pushing and making moves, this begins to open up more. There's a lot more movement in 1918 there, than there has been in most of the war. And this is really where the Americans will come into this uh, this period. So just a few slides again, of course, these are from uh, uh, from the period. So we've seen uh, in historical sources uh, some of the trenches. You can see some of these gentlemen are, you know, up to their knees in, in mud and water and uh, very deplorable conditions trying to catch some sleep and some rest and these others and everything. But uh, the nature of it, lots of use of barbed wire and fortifications and things. So very difficult uh, situations to take these kind of things on head on and, uh, and be successful. Um, these are just a couple slides of some of the German dugouts and some of the code talkers will, um, will be involved in places fighting against these kind of fortifications. And so um, some of these are even two and three story uh, units underground uh, to where you can see you can go down and, and get out of the uh, depth of the shelling and the shell holes and things of that nature. And again, have a relative amount of safety down in there and heat. Some of them even had electricity, et cetera. But uh, a lot of these were, these dugouts were large enough to house companies of men of well over 200 uh, men and everything. So it, they've had time to prepare these, dig these, et cetera, and uh, um, much greater um, uh, fortifications than what the uh, allies are producing as they're trying to overtake these and everything. And again, just some, uh, a few background slides, but some uh, uh, scenes of some of the, the effects of the bombing, uh, the machine gunning, et cetera, and where it, it really devastates and uh, uh, denudes the land generally. And so this one in the lower right is all shell holes that have filled in with water. And you can see a few remaining uh, tree uh, tree uh, trunks left and everything, but very horrible uh, conditions. And then, of course, going over the uh, top, out of the trenches, going across the barbed wire, et cetera. And then things like we mentioned, gas, all these type of things are uh, very uh, real and frequent um, uh, possibilities that you have to, uh, to counter in this type of warfare. Um, this is a group at Choctaw. You, you will sometimes see this photo identified as the Choctaw uh, Code Talkers. It, it is not. That, that is a mistaken assumption. What this is, is a recruiting photo where a recruiter came to uh, um, the uh, Armstrong Indian Academy at Bochito, which is uh, east of Durant, Oklahoma, very south uh, border of Oklahoma. And uh, there is a there is a good information there that basically the whole baseball team uh, asked their superintendent, it, could they have permission to enlist? And so he granted them that uh, blessing. And so this may be the actual baseball team, but regardless, it's a group of uh, all Choctaws from this Indian school uh, that volunteered this day and signed up. Um, the idea to form co-talkers will not happen until very late in 1918. So this is, there's no uh, even concept of it in, uh, 
in the psyche yet or anything of this nature. So this is simply a recruiting photo. But Indian schools were a primary area to recruit um, young native men. And the schools, as we'll, we'll find out, it preconditioned them for military service because most of them were run on a somewhat military background in that you had very time schedules. A lot of them had uniforms, uh, marching to classes, putting up the flag and down. You slept in a barracks like quarters oftentimes where you had to make your uh, make your bed to specifications. So there is an element of a uh, few of the things that you would get in basic training that was innate to these children since they entered this school and had done it uh, by this time up into their junior and senior years. So it's actually going to precondition a lot of them uh, to make uh, the initial part of military service fairly uh, fairly easy. So how and why did this develop, this, this concept of code talking? And so there again, we enter the war, uh, you know, fairly late and everything of this nature. Um, the code talking is really, it's primarily going to be focused around the Muse Argonne campaign. We do have one, uh, one recorded instance of it beginning a little bit earlier at uh, like Chateau Thierry and everything. But most of the cases that we have documented are going to be in the Muse Argonne. So the situation that we're having here, to put it kind of into layman terms, is that it's a communication security. Uh, the Germans are, are highly intelligent people. They have incredible linguists. Uh, you know, they have scholars that know most of the languages in the world and things of that nature, and of course have cultivated that into their military. And so the situation is that the allied uh, communications are being simply broken, uh, codes are being figured out and compromised, et cetera, due to the linguistic capacity of the Germans. And of course, most of these are being based on either numerical systems systems or the English language, which the Germans are very familiar with. So there's a few key problems here. Um, you have phone lines run between companies uh, up on the front line. Uh, and then back to your battalion, your regiment, your division, so forth and so on. Well, anybody who gets uh, at any point to that wire can simply clip into it and then it just becomes a party line. You can sit there and monitor every word that's that's said just like you picked up a phone on a on a party line. Uh, there are distance learning devices. So these work basically they are kind of a magnetic um, wire coil that is positioned and they can be anywhere from uh, two to four kilometers back from the front line. And they're capable of magnetically pulling a telephone or radio signal uh, to where again, you can monitor it, you can hear what people are saying. So you don't even have to really be within um, distance of the front line to be able to you just need a clear line of, of, uh, of focus. Um, now we have some things like that. Um, so we're also doing the same, th trying to do the same things, but this is compromising a lot of messages. We do have a type of uh, instrument called a buzzer phone, which works with uh, lights and sound and different, different links and uh, patterns. Uh, it's something that has to be coded to send a message. So it's slow, it's kind of clunky and it's, it's slow and it's time consuming, which means everything in a, in a battle situation. Um, and then we have runners physically carrying written messages. But the minute that a runner pops up out of a trench, they are going to draw uh, sniper fire, uh, sometimes machine gun fire, and, and sometimes more efforts to take them out uh, because it's realized they're carrying intelligence, you know, down the line to another unit. So roughly some of the reports talk about in the American forces, one in four runners, physical runners, are either being shot so the message does not go through or they're being captured by Germans close to the lines. And so then you, they have your message as well as your uh, runner. So the dire need is for some type of secure communications and something that's more immediate, something that is faster than encrypting things, sending it, and then spending a lot of time uh, decoding it. And really something that's faster than coding and decoding, that's the primary uh, primary focus here is, is that possible? Can we think of that, that uh, idea? These are just a couple slides. Uh, these are not native folks here, but just a couple slides of uh, 
field signal battalions laying wire and with the switchboard and telephone, things of this nature to show you some of the nature of the work and the kind of equipment uh, in laying lines to units and things of this nature. So uh, here's a close up as the Americans are pushing uh, more and more towards the end of the war, particularly the summer of 18, around places like St. Mihiel, uh, St. Etienne, etc. The Germans are retreating after a series of battles and they're finding that they are not only leaving some of their telephones uh, behind, but they're leaving the wire systems intact. They're not even uh, 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 scuttling them. So um, basically the suspicion, of course, is they're leaving these phone lines intact so that Americans will use them for convenience, but they, again, are connected in and can overhear it. Um, so the Americans check a lot of these lines and uh, they still have their own communications, but this is a, a common uh, tactic that's being used at the time. And so this is kind of a, you know, a, a, a shelled out uh, shelter here or house in which uh, they're checking a, a phone here. So <clears throat> late in the war, uh, the drive, those of you that have studied World War I, uh, in this sector, right, in this sector, um, where our red lines are here. So the focus in this area is to take the city of Sedan. Um, Sedan is critical. Why Sedan? Well, because it is the major railroad hub. And so it is the key central location of rail lines hooking up in this region uh, that both supplied German troops to supply their lines for reinforcements, but also their supplies in terms of food, ammunition, um, armaments, so forth and so on. Um, there is a series of heights above Sedan. So the strategy is if those heights can be taken, then the railroad station can be controlled with machine gun fire. And uh, you can basically sever the German army in half in terms of supply and troops and things if we can take that railroad hub. So there are, of course, the, the whole front is much longer and everything, but some of the groups um, that are gonna have code talkers, there are some up near uh, St. Quentin, uh, but a lot of them are going to be down here closer to Chateau Thierry, Verdun, uh, St. Mihiel, and pushing towards uh, Sedan here in this sector here. Um, the first three groups that I've been able to date, uh, and this is, this is the difficult thing, um, because this was not a pre-existing plan, this is, this is something that just came up in the field during and very late in the war, really. Um, there was no master plan, there's no army manual, there's no um, intelligence or uh, forms or process to train in this. It's simply improvising to solve a solution and everything. So there are three groups <clears throat> that I have been able to tie the actual dates down for when they <clears throat> first started using their code talking. There's at least four other groups in World War I that we know used it, but we simply uh, do not have a specification on dates. Uh, most likely it's still going to be late in uh, 1918 and everything. So for many, many years, it, you know, myself included, uh, believed that the Choctaws were the first ones to use um, a code in, in uh, user language in World War I uh, until I stumbled onto some Cherokee information, which uh, predated that by about two or two and a half weeks. Um, and then I stumbled onto some material where uh, a couple of Ho-Chunk individuals in the 3rd Infantry uh, Division were using it um, no later than July of 1918. So that's the chronology we have now, and we'll go through some of those case studies. So the maps and the tribal flags here, you can see um, the uh, Ho-Chunk are from Wisconsin. There are different groups of them, but this is the Wisconsin group. Uh, the Choctaw are going to be down in Southeast Oklahoma in the red uh, panel down here. Uh, and then the Cherokee, there's actually going to be two different elements of them used. Uh, one from Oklahoma, where the largest group or the Western Cherokee are today, and then the Eastern Band at Quala uh, in Western North Carolina. So I have two flags for the Cherokee because there will be uh, Cherokee from both communities used in this uh, location. So this is one of the earliest things uh, I came across. This is the Indian School Journal. So this is basically the uh, Carlisle Indian School newspaper or journal in a sense. And um, one of the um, uh, individuals, Robert uh, Big Thunder, um, 
wrote he was wounded uh, uh, in part of Chateau Thierry and everything and was relieved and everything. He was wounded enough. He got put out of action and sent back to the States. And he wrote a letter home to his father uh, explaining what he had been doing, the nature of it, and also, you know, how his... Uh, um, the article says, I believe that it was his, uh, I think it says his brother, but I found out it's actually his brother-in-law is the individual that he enlisted with, John Longtail. And so he described how they, um, you know, use their language on the radio and things of that nature. So by the dates, I, I ran his records, by the dates of his, uh, his wounding and removal, and then the start of that uh, individual campaign, I'm able to narrow it down to a fairly a small window there and say, okay, it has to be no later than uh, this particular section here and everything. Uh, and this is a case, again, the 3rd Infantry Division where just two individuals who spoke a common language were put at two points and able to communicate freely, uh, knowing that the Germans would not recognize this language, they'd have no familiarity or background with it, and that it would uh, work. Later, I found uh, his military records, which confirmed his uh, his place, and I also found his card in some of the uh, Indian veteran files at the National Archives, and on his card from 1919, it specifically states that he also used his Indian language for uh, radio communications and everything. So uh, next we'll go to the Eastern Band Cherokee, and so this is going to be in the 30th Division, which is uh, primarily North and South Carolina. Uh, over here, and they were more up near uh, Cambrai and St. Quentin and, and up in this area is where they were going. Um, so this is their operational map from St. Quentin and, and Cambrai. Um, so September 27th to October 20th. So again, it's fairly late in the war. Uh, the 119th and 120th uh, regiments had really come up to some stumbling blocks here. And uh, one of the accounts in here is that <clears throat> one of the officers, and I believe it was a company commander, so around, you know, around uh, uh, captain, uh, captain or better um, rank, was talking to another officer one morning on the phone and said something, I'm paraphrasing, but something to the amount of, how is it over your, your way? What are you receiving? And the other one replied, oh, nothing. They said, uh, the Germans have been shelling us all morning, but they're hitting 100 meters behind us consistently. We haven't taken a scratch this morning, you know. Within just a couple minutes, that artillery had been adjusted and it started coming right in on the, on the, uh, the spot where that officer was speaking to the other one. And that's where they realized they could hear their, their, they've tapped into us or whatever they know, everything we're saying and everything we're doing. So they pulled together, they were having trouble moving on this position. Uh, they pulled together their signal battalion officers um, uh, and said, you know, here's our situation. What can we do to solve this? Uh, one of them that we'll see his paper here in a minute um, had been in the National Guard, like a lot of uh, people before World War I. And he said, uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of, of Cherokee Indians from North Carolina that were in the old first and second uh, North Carolina Guard, and they have to be here, you know, after it was federalized. They're in the unit here somewhere. We need to find them. So they pulled a number of them together and began to put them on uh, phones. And then uh, it solved the problem. They could talk freely. You could make movements and things. Nobody was was uh, figuring out what you were doing. Um, the record is detailed in some aspects as far as the dates and what they were using. Unfortunately, the officer does not name anybody uh, in the unit. And, you know, of course, we would love to have that information today. But seriously, who names a bunch of privates and things in a just a uh, an adjustment in a field operation that that kind of thing is not uh, dealt with, and it was to solve the problem and move on and everything. But he did leave us some records. He <clears throat> was taking further officer uh, training later at Fort Benning in the 30s, and uh, Captain John Stanley. So he was in the 105th Signal Battalion. And um, so he wrote, the next day a meeting of the signal officers was called by the division signal officer to discuss ways and means to overcome this danger, which was now beginning to be realized. At this meeting, I pointed out to division signal officer, the old 1st North Carolina Regiment, which was split up at Camp Severe, South Carolina, um, and its personnel assigned to the 19th, 119th, 120th Regiments contained quite a few number of Cherokee Indians 
which were now somewhere in the division. Uh, my opinion, a number of the most intelligent of them were placed at each telephone and they uh, transmit all messages in their native tongue. I felt sure that even a battalion commander could use them in transmitting messages to his company commanders in perfect safety. So the next day, every command post from br brigade forward, um, including uh, some company command posts, had a Cherokee at the phone. So um, not knowing exactly what their battle plan was, I tried to uh, look at that schematically and estimate around how many. And it could be it could be anywhere from 19 up to 30 or so, uh, depending on how they deployed. Uh, but needless to say, they rounded up quite a few of them. And uh, so I ran the division records. And again, they didn't name any of them, but I was able to confirm there are more than a few Cherokee Indians in these regiments uh, at this actual campaign. So most likely some of them were the ones that were used, but we simply can't put a name um, officially yet. We've, we've found no records of an individual being named and everything. Um, so about the second or third day, the system was put in effect. Um, they captured a German officer and uh, back at the headquarters, he, he basically uh, asked some uh, gentlemen, we have officers in our army that can speak and translate the majority of languages of the world, but none of them can understand the language you Americans are using over the telephone. Now, please, gentlemen, won't you tell me what it is? and everything. And uh, of course, they didn't give the uh, uh, the secret away and everything. Um, he was finally relieved on October 12th and sent uh, sent back to the States. And but it, to his knowledge, they continued to use the uh, Cherokee until the war ended and everything of that nature. Um, so that's one of the really good, um, as far as exact units, exact dates, things of that nature, we have that, um, that information very well. And I'm still, still probing and digging, hoping one of these days I might get into something that refers to some of the names of the actual men that were used. But so, so far, I, I cannot, uh, uh, cannot say. Um, the other thing I will mention about that is that it's, it's also difficult to identify who all is native because by this time, many Cherokees have um, Anglo surnames, either from boarding school or intermarriage or just, you know, given to them, et cetera. So some Cherokee names are very distinct and they, they jump right out at you, but there's others which are, you know, you don't know whether this is an Anglo with this name or if it is a native with this name. And so uh, uh, a lot more work would have to be done to, to determine some of that. Uh, we're going to switch a little bit to the Choctaw in the 142nd Infantry Regiment. So this will be the 36th Division. This is coming primarily out of eastern Oklahoma and parts of Texas. And it is the group in which we have the most documentation, the, the most details, et cetera, uh, about. So <clears throat> in the 142nd, there was E Company. And it was referred to as the Indian Company because at one point, um, it had around 215 men, and other than a handful of officers, which were uh, uh, Anglo, and um, one individual private who was uh, of Irish-American background, everybody else in the company was, was pure Native. And uh, so hence they called it the Indian Company. They also called it the Millionaire Company because a few of the individuals came from very uh, prevalent families who had uh, oil on their land and were, were actually quite wealthy. Uh, others, the exact opposite, very, very, you know, poor. Many of these men, though, had went to boarding school. So they were very fluent. Many of them were very fluent in English, but also in their, their own language, and also uh, quite educated for the time. There's a lot of uh, soldiers in World War I that uh, are not fully completed through high school or very, very low uh, education levels and everything. So this is a picture at the time when it's still primarily native. Uh, later about, um, I believe it's about 50 members will be transferred out of this company to the 42nd division as replacements. Um, and so non-Indians will be brought in here, but the company remained 50% or better, they said, uh, through the whole war. So it continued to be referred to. They had people that spoke 26 languages um, in this unit here and everything. And we have a list of all the members by name, uh, also by tribal associations. So there was like 60 some uh, Choctaws in here. There were almost 60 some Cherokees and then smaller groupings. And then the, uh, the one white guy in the unit uh, was listed as the Irish tribe. 
uh, and everything, which I'm sure people found amusing at the time. Uh, but this is the unit in which the Choctaw Code Talkers will be picked from, will be culled out of this unit later. And then here is their uh, division patches, which didn't really start being worn till, uh, till the end of the war, pretty much and after. But this is at, um, uh, in Texas at Camp Barkley. Uh, these are five of the original eight code talkers, and this is the officer who was charged with uh, recruiting them, picking them out, and, and organizing them. So uh, Captain E.W. Horner um, is actually out of Mena, Arkansas, which is right across the border from the Choctaw uh, Territory, just a handful of miles. He was in the National Guard well uh, before World War I, so he knew a lot of these men, had worked closely with them. Um, the company commander, he was a lieutenant going in, the company commander was killed in action early and he uh, became company commander. So he received uh, at a certain site, we'll look at examine in a minute, he received a call from the, from the uh, signal intelligence uh, regimental level said, uh, I want you to find eight, um, eight Indians in your company who speak English very, very good and are also very fluent in their own language. So he called out some that he thought were the, uh, the best choices. And he actually had a couple of them help me. Who else is the best? The best English speakers, the best Choctaw speakers, etc. cetera. And uh, there were three others of the eight. Now, uh, in some letters of his that I got later, uh, he wrote down, he named uh, these five exact men, and uh, he said, but I, you know, there were three more, but I can't recall their names at these times, so we know what pool they're out of, uh, and we know exactly the dates and what they're, what they're going to do here in a second, but this is after, this is actually 1919 when they're at um, uh, Fort Dix on their way home, and uh, uh, coming back from, from Europe and everything. These are some of the other men and eventually what we're going to find a lot of a lot of years through time there has been different estimates and numbers of Choctaw code talkers and at first it, it, you know it's hard to justify those until i came into some papers that that really make it make sense uh, the original eight were used in combat and it was very very effective as we're going to see uh, they were then as soon as that campaign and that position was taken they were relieved and they were sent back to a rest camp about three days uh, march away. At the rest camp then, the group was increased to the size of 18 uh, enlisted men and three non-commissioned officers, so 21 total. And they actually went through a week of training under a, another lieutenant who, who was actually a Cheyenne um, Indian from Oklahoma who served in this, um, in this unit and uh, developed, actually developed actual code words, come up with names for things that they didn't have in their native language, et cetera, and everything. And we'll get to the, uh, the conclusion of that in just a minute. So that's why later on we begin to get numbers like 18, 19, et cetera. Unfortunately, the, the records do not list who the group of 18 is or do they list who the three non-commissioned officers are. But from the family accounts over the years, the number is just about spot on. Uh, equal and everything. So um, this is um, at St. Etienne, which uh, the 36th uh, take, and it's one of its first uh, really major battles and everything. As it takes at St. Etienne, which was a, a, a pretty strong fight, um, the Germans uh, retreat, and you'll see this peninsula up here where it says Forest Farm, the blue arrow at the top there. So the Germans retreated across the Ain River with the exception of this peninsula, this horseshoe. And it, there's an old uh, farm on it and it's, it's a heavily forested area. So that's why the name Forest Farm or Forest, uh, forest Firm in French. The Germans held this because it was high ground and it, was, it, was, uh, it had a lot of barbed wire, a lot of machine gun positions. It was uphill, et cetera. It was a very defensible position, but also you had a big view of the flat out of head of you. So you were not going to approach it unnoticed. So the French tried, um, so they've basically taken, uh, retreated across the river with the exception of this position. So the allies can't cross the Ain because they will basically be observed uh, laterally and, and have artillery called on them and, and be compromised. So this position has to be taken. Uh, the French tried to take it twice and suffered very, very heavy casualties, lots of, of loss of individuals. Uh, they were relieved 
the 36th to 142nd, 141st was called up and said, it's, it's your, uh, your plan now. And so they were pulled up to uh, take this peninsula. So this is a blown up, this is the actual 36 map from the records uh, of the peninsula and everything. And so you have the Ayn River uh, snaking around this peninsula. You also have a canal there as well. And then there is a, a small uh, village in here. You can see the, uh, the uh, lateral lines here. These are the German uh, defenses at the at the start of the slope and going up to this rise, and uh, this is a very you know um, intelligence map where they they fixed machine gun positions, barbed wire lines, uh, found concentrations, etc. Before they uh, devised their strategy. Uh, towards the bottom, you can see 141st Infantry, 142nd, and then all the companies. It actually shows which companies were engaged in this. Some were held in reserve, etc. So the commander of the group uh, has this idea. We have, we have this very, very native company here. We're gonna pull eight men uh, Choctaws out of it. We also know that some Cherokees were used out of this unit, but we do, we only have a couple brief mentions of them in the documents. So we don't know how many or where they were positioned. Um, these Choctaws were basically spread out by company here so that you had a individual manning uh, the uh, uh, company phones and everything. Um, the day before the attack, they sent um, reconnaissance guys up uh, little ravines, any kind of depression, secreted them so they could get close to the German lines, remain out of sight, and simply listen and observe. So a, a listening post, observation post. Um, they came back with the uh, intelligence uh, of, at the end of that day that the Germans had not moved or done anything that seemed to be that they were on to what was being planned. Meanwhile, the communications had all been sent up and down in Choctaw. And so what would happen is at, um, let's see here, I think it's at 4.10 p.m. if I remember right, I, I might be off a little on the moments. Um, they had their artillery um, to start hitting this very first lateral line here. And these lines are three minute increments is what they were based on. And so all this artillery would focus in, a, in a, uh, a lateral line and in three minutes, just keep walking, walking, walking to the next point. So what this did, of course, the artillery forced the Germans to get down into their positions uh, in order not to be hit by all the shrapnel and the, and the uh, concussions and everything. So it took their eyes off the field and the barrage was kept up very steady for almost 20, 20 some minutes. The troops then, uh, really just rushed very closely behind the artillery. They followed it very, very closely. And so as soon as the artillery uh, ceased or moved past an area, they were able to overrun it. And so there was approximately 500 Germans in this position and uh, the Americans killed uh, around 270 some, took the rest of them uh, prisoner, uh, only lost 14 men in the entire operation. And so the Germans were, were caught completely uh, by surprise. Um, sure, they heard the messages, but had no idea what was being said or, or what it had to do. So this was, this was the proof that this worked uh, very, very effectively. They also continued to use Choctaw uh, for the next couple of days there, even we have some uh, messages that were sent like to relieve wounded, to bring medical supplies that were also done in Choctaw, so the enemy would not gain any information about uh, our conditions and what was going on in our lines and everything. But this is the, the uh, very famous uh, uh, small battle in the big picture of things, but one of the uh, most documented cases of where we know exactly how the code was used, how it worked, uh, things of that nature. Uh, this is Otis Leader. He was in the 1st Division, 1st uh, Infantry Division, and he actually, he actually was one of the first uh, American soldiers uh, to be in, uh, in combat and everything in World War I. And um, there is a, a newspaper interview with him in the 50s, and he was, wound, he, was, he was wounded a couple times. He was gassed three times. And in the final one, they uh, just told him, you're just going to wait this out. It was already late October. But uh, he was pulled out of the hospital at some point in the recovery ward and put on a phone specifically to speak uh, Choctaw. So we don't know if this is something more from, say, a division post or a, a command post uh, further back. Uh, to front uh, front echelon lines or something of that nature, but we have a 
another case of him being used. And he's an interesting story. Um, he was a, a foreman on a cattle ranch in Oklahoma, and his, the two ranch owners were Swiss, Swiss Americans. They went to the uh, Fort Worth stock sales to sell some cattle and to buy some replacement cattle uh, in 17 in spring. And of course, there were spies in America. There's many cases of some being caught and arrested. Well, there were federal agents there and they saw him and his dark complexion um, and the men he were with had a very... Uh, distinct accent and everything. So they thought that he was Spanish. And so they identified him as a potential Spanish spy and as the other two as Germans. And so they watched what train they got on. They telegraphed and had the city marshal waiting to arrest them when they got off the train. And when they walked off the train, he laughed because he'd known all of them most of his life. And so he called and got this all cleared up and everything. But Leader was so incensed over being thought that he was a spy that he went and enlisted immediately and uh, uh, had small children and everything, but got them situated and, and he wanted to serve. And uh, he said, put, a, put an end to all this German nonsense that was going on. So um, quite, quite a patriotic uh, story there. Uh, these are just some of the other Choctaw Code Talkers, some of their papers and uh, uh, later on medals, Tobias Frazier. Uh, we'll talk briefly about the Comanche here a little bit. They were in the 90th Division, which again is from uh, Western Oklahoma and Texas. So it's going to have uh, a lot of natives in this unit as well, uh, just because of the nature of, it, of its uh, demography and everything. So there were five uh, Comanche gentlemen that were in um, World War I that were in this unit that we know of. And we have two things. Um, I was able to interview uh, Edward Nakwadi's son, Junior, Edward Nakwadi Jr., who actually was a World War II code talker. And so his father had told him about what they did and, and how they stumbled onto it and everything. And then Calvin uh, Achevit over here, uh, there were newspaper articles on him. He was awarded a Belgian war cross for using his language in a situation where um, troops in the 90th were cut off and surrounded by Germans. And so they got him on the phone, got a hold of one of the others and did all the communications in Comanche so the Germans would not understand the precariousness of their position. And then they got, uh, they got help and got relieved and everything. And there's also newspaper articles about him in 1919 that talk about him using uh, his, uh, uh, his language and everything. Again, we don't have exact dates, but it's, it's, uh, it's either at St. Mihiel uh, or the uh, Argonne, it's very late in the war when these gentlemen, so we base this looking at their, uh, their dates of when they're actually in combat, when they were wounded and taken out, you know, permanently and things of that nature to narrow down the, uh, the window. And so this is uh, Calvin Atovich, um, or Atovich, sorry, his uh, uh, photo with, he also won the Distinguished Service Cross, uh, uh, he was shot through the arm and very seriously wounded, but he still uh, pressed, pressed his attack and uh, killed a German with one arm and then uh, captured another one and everything. And, uh, and then was given the Belgian War Cross for his uh, code talking. So this is uh, uh, in the Indian file up here. Uh, it talks about his Comanche tongue helped him get messages across that were not understood by the enemy. And so this is, again, uh, we have multiple... Um, you know, confirming sources, which is what we want as, as scholars. Um, this is George Adair. We have uh, two brief uh, mentions in the 36 records about using where this letter says employed Cherokee and Choctaw Indians in the 142nd. So we know right where they were. This is an individual who's identified in a 1926 book um, about using, that's his World War I photo, but about using his language. He was actually a cook and was pulled off of that detail and put up near the front uh, specifically to talk on the radio to other Cherokees and everything. So unfortunately for the Oklahoma Cherokees, we do not, we know who all was in that unit, but he's the only one we have specific evidence that he was uh, singled out as a co-talker. So undoubtedly there are more, but we, we may not ever know unless we stumble into another file that uh, uh, specifies. But for myself, the importance um, 
it's not always just how many, but it's getting the groups identified and, and uh, getting them recognized with uh, any and all data that we can, we can get, you know. Why does this work? Okay, why does it work? The big question. So there's several things we could look at kind of categorically. So these languages, Choctaw, Comanche, Cherokee, there's also Ho-Chunk used, there's Lakota used, um, there's, there's some others that are used here. They are little known and, and what I mean by that, they are little known outside of their own communities. Of course, they're well known and understood at home, but most Americans are not aware of them. They, they know natives have their own languages, but most people in America, non-Indians do not know native languages. Europeans do not know native languages at this time. So in that, in that nature, they're obscure languages. And these are fairly small groups. You know, uh, Comanches had, you know, a couple thousand people around World War I. Choctaws, Cherokee is much larger, but compared to Germany or France or uh, Italy, these are, these are much smaller nations. They're largely unwritten languages. Now, Cherokee and Choctaw have both been written since around the 1820-30 period, um, but the majority of the language was just local consumption. It was Bibles, it was hymn books for singing uh, Choctaw or Cherokee hymns in their own language, uh, or it was local newspapers and things, again, that, that only they could read and everything. So it's not the kind of materials that were famous or that were widely circulated that would end up in a, a German library or, you know, something of that nature. It's off the radar, in other words. Uh, <clears throat> they're complete full languages, so they're not based on mathematical code principles. So a lot of codes, ciphers and things, um, you substitute, you can substitute letter numbers for other numbers or numbers with a value and change that order around. You can change the meaning of letters. So today F will be the letter A and uh, Z will be the letter B and so forth and so on. And you can change that order. But uh, anytime you're using a code or something like that, um, you have to be careful because of the frequency of patterns. All human languages have a relatively small number of vowels and majority consonants and things. So you begin, you hear certain uh, patterns or if they're in writing, you begin to get clues about what these words are and everything. Um, they're not, these languages are not based on European languages. So the syntax is different. Uh, the word order, you know, the assignment, things like that. Um, some of the ways in which things are expressed are sometimes uh, what would what would seem like a very long singular phrase or word uh, to a non-speaker, uh, but conveys several different uh, meanings. So almost like a sentence sometimes, a very complex statement, but said in a, in, in a long um, single, single word and everything. Uh, so syntax, order, all that kind of thing is different. So you don't have that basis to compare it for similarities with French or German or English or something else, right? So these are unknown languages, um, tribal languages. Then the Choctaw, like we said, they actually formed some code at the end of that. So when they were relieved, they went back to uh, Louis, Louis Le Petit as a rest area. And from November 5th to 10th, they had a, um, a, um, a training session specifically that week, just for those 21 guys uh, to form in the uh, Choctaw code. Now, they finish their code words on November 10th. So what happens the next day? Obviously the war ends. So they do not get to take that coded vocabulary and use it back into, they were getting ready to head towards Metz and Sedan, uh, but they do not get to use the formal code terms again and everything. Um, so the languages were, um, you know, really just, just uh, getting by the best you can in your own languages. But, this will set a very important precedent as we see uh, later in World War II, we have multiple codes, not all, but multiple languages that have very extensive coded vocabularies in them and everything. So the code talkers are widely covered in the press. And this is one of the, uh, I like to refer to it as an urban and rural code talking uh, uh, myth. Um, there's, there's a very widespread idea that everything about this was secret, hush, hush, etc. And for the Navajo in World War II, they did, it was classified and they tried very hard to keep it classified, even though there were leaks. But to give you an example, um, in uh, February of, uh, of 1919, the uh, company commander 
uh, writes a letter detailing exactly what he did and everything. It's, it's published in the French newspaper in French, and then it's published in English over here. Um, you have you have no effort, and there there's articles on Lakotas, there's articles on Choctaws, Cherokees, etc. Um, there is no effort to keep this secret. It's seen as simply the word they keep using back then is what a slick trick. You know, look what we pulled on the Germans, etc. Because nobody thought there was going to be another world war. Uh, this was not something. This was all done at the local level. It was something from higher command, um, you know, chief staff of the army or anything. So it really wasn't uh, had a cap put on or anything. So people were free to talk about it. There was lots and lots of newspaper articles uh, starting in 1919, and they ran for decades and everything of that nature. So it, it actually was very widely covered in the press, and then just kind of forgot. Uh, the Choctaw again are the best documented. And then um, again, the important thing is the legacy of using the languages and then the idea about forming the code words. This will set a legacy that uh, in World War II, Comanche, Meskwaki, who you would know as the Sac or the Sauk in the Sauk and Fox uh, two groups, uh, some Chippewa, some Oneida, Hopi, Navajo and, and others, they will form code words in World War II, uh, working off of the Choctaw idea. So the army doesn't forget about it and it will come back up uh, again. So this is, um, and this was part of a big study. There was an officer who, um, as the war ended, he was gassed, he was sent back to the US and he was given the uh, opportunity to do a survey and a study of the returning native veterans, because there was over 12,000 native veterans in World War I, um, to, you know, what were their experiences, uh, how, talk to their officers, how did they function, how was their service, also get their viewpoints, etc. And so he wrote to all the units where he knew uh, there were natives in there, and then e even others just to uh, see if they had some. And this is one of the letters that Captain uh, uh, Colonel Blur, excuse me, uh, Colonel uh, A.W. Blur wrote back, and he's talking about uh, first action of 42nd at St. Etienne. They discovered all the problems with getting messages through, runners, listening, all this, and then basically um, when, they're, when they're in the Vaux Champagne uh, region, how they come up with the idea and exactly how they pull it off. Uh, Forest Farm is cited in there, and it basically just describes in a nutshell exactly what they did, how they did it, and, and how they implemented it. So this was this was released, not just the military, it was released to the newspapers verbatim. And so uh, we actually will see in just a moment, we'll see where this is actually published verbatim in newspapers and things. Here's the actual code list. Um, that William Morrissey, who was the uh, lieutenant colonel and he was the head of the signal battalion, um, from memory, he did the best he could in March of 1919 and said, these are the terms that we come up with. And again, it's just basic things. Um, the code does not have to be that complex. It's simply, you just need something that's agreed upon to get the idea across. So the word for gas is bad air in Choctaw, right? Very effective, you know. Uh, artillery is referred to as a big gun uh, rather than, you know, handheld firearms and everything. A machine gun is referred to as a little gun shoots fast. So very basic things to get the concepts. There's no term for first battalion, second battalion, third. That's, that's, that's Western thinking. So they just develop terms like one grain of corn, two grains of corn, three grains, first battalion, second, third. Again, it's not what the content was, it's that nobody else knew what these meant except these, uh, these men and everything of that nature. But this is just a sample of, of, uh, of the uh, original first Choctaw code words, and this is the actual document from uh, 1919. So here's uh, some of the news releases that come back. So you can see here's an Oklahoma newspaper, um, March 28th, 1919. Now, the 36th Division doesn't get back. Most of them don't come back until June, right? So this is this is widely published back here, even before the guys leave uh, Europe. So Colonel Bloor makes use, uh, you know, Choctaw tongue gave surprise to Germans, uh, uses it to dodge listening in of spies. And then you can see there, Flagny, France, February 27th. It's the verbatim article again. And then we see other articles back here, Indian tongue used this code to dodge spies. And this, this just gets run everywhere. Uh, I found dozens and dozens of 
accounts just in like 1919 to say 1921. Um, so again, our we expect when you say code, everyone thinks naturally it's got to be kept secret. It wouldn't be effective and everything. But again, this was to solve uh, in the field an incident and then no long-term planning, just simply you know move on by it. When the war ended, people were thankful to be alive. They wanted to come home, get back to their business. Nobody was worrying about this, uh, this kind of thing. Here's another one from 1919. Now, here's my logic on this. If you wanted to keep this secret, the Stars and Stripes, which is the official army newspaper, would not run an article on using Indians as code talkers or, or using their languages as codes. So this is once again, a good example where it, it just simply was, was uh, it was, um, it was an interesting, you know, human interest story, and it was slick what was done, and so it was very uh, showcased in the newspapers and everything. But this is from uh, uh, January of 1919 in the Stars and Stripes. Um, this is one even continuing in the Tulsa World in 37, 1937, where it's an article on the Choctaws. It has some of them pictured here, etc., and uh, stories. And there's, like I say, there are articles, uh, dozens year by year for many, many years across different papers, uh, you know, across the country and everything. Uh, now, the irony of this, of course, is that the majority of these gentlemen that went through this type of service as code talkers and Indian soldiers in general, not just those that ended up doing some code talking, um, went through the Indian boarding school system and everything. So there is, a, there is a lot of variation depending on when you went through boarding school and if it is a local one, if it is an out-of-state, out off-reservation. But uh, in general, these institutions, of course, um, were trying to uh, assimilate natives into mainstream American culture. They did not encourage, and many of them did not permit the speaking of the native languages. Uh, the wearing of any traditional clothing, etc. So you can see this is Carlisle, one of the largest and most famous in Pennsylvania, right? Um, and of course, in your back door there. Uh, but you can see where all the girls have a standard type of, of uh, outfit. All the boys have a standard, very military cadet looking style uniform. Uh, typically, these were wool at the time. And so that's why I say there's a very strong um, there's a very strong pattern of where this was this was adopted similar to kind of like a military academy type style of again uh, marching to class, marching to your meals, <clears throat> um, barracks like conditions, etc. Like that. Um, some groups even had later on had ROTC in time, ROTC groups in the Indian schools and like at Haskell and places like that. But uh, this is the I think the really uh, important point is that. Some of these children went there so young that they lost the ability to speak their language. They come out monolingual in English. Some of them though, particularly if you were a little bit older going into it, um, a lot of these guys were able to hang on to the language. And then when they got in service, they were quite gracious to share it, right? And uh, we have no indication that anybody refused to use it. Uh, it was you know, a unique way that they could contribute and they were very uh, willing to do so. So that's that's you know kind of a backdrop there that puts a whole uh, element on the the whole story both for World War One and it will repeat in World War Two. Most of the World War Two guys I interviewed also all went through uh, boarding schools. So in my work, I, I noticed there's two different things going on here. There's two variations of of what we'll call code talking. Um, the first is the use of basically native languages. You know the enemy doesn't know them, etc and they contain coded vocabulary. These will start with a Choctaw and then it will continue in World War II. The majority of them in World War I and also in World War II later on will simply be cases, uh, there's about seven groups we know that had formal codes, but the majority of them will just be kind of a de facto uh, getting, group, getting individuals that speak the same language to get the message across as good as you know, thoroughly as possible just in their everyday uh, language. And so I refer to that as type two. So type one has coded vocabulary. Type two is just the everyday use of your vernacular uh, language. Uh, this is a, a chart from World War uh, One and everything. Um, some of those, uh, the Cheyenne, there is a reference, but we don't have anything really 
uh, tight. I've, the Cheyennes themselves have contacted me. We've we've contacted each other different ways, but there's a mention, but we do not have identifications. Um, the Sioux um, is another issue where we have several articles mentioning them, but Sioux um, is a very, very generic large term. It involves groups all the way from uh, Minnesota, the Dakotas, over into Montana. There's and so there's many different tribes, many different reservations, and uh, identifying all those uh, individuals is is a difficult task and everything. Um, the Choctaw, we know how many were used. The Comanche, the Ho Chunk, we know. Um, of course, uh, we know the Choctaw. To, again, this could change with a new file that appears somewhere. But to the best of our knowledge, to the present, uh, the Choctaw are the only one. That we know developed code terms and, uh, and but didn't get to, to use them. So these are spread out in in a variety of units and they're all kind of done uh, independently. There's no overarching uh, plan there. And again, uh, just what our dates is again, this could change uh, you know at any time with more research, but this is the dates where we we know the Ho chunk are using it before June 21st when one of them is permanently put out of commission and sent back. Uh, the Eastern Band start theirs on the 7th or the 8th. The wording and the document is just a little vague, but it, it's one of those two days. And then the uh, Choctaw and Oklahoma Cherokees will start on October 26th, uh, 27th. And um, uh, I wish we had the dates for the others, uh, perhaps down the road, you know. Uh, there are some French decorations for individual Choctaws and things. Uh, nothing specifically for code talking or anything of that nature. Again, in our present day, um, we marvel at this. We think how, you know, it is, it, how special, how unique, how resilient of these men, right? To hang on to their languages through boarding schools and then again, be gracious enough to share them and everything. But the few accounts we have for these people, it's just, they were asked to do it and they did it. They, they weren't thinking about it. They weren't looking for a claim. They didn't see it as anything like really special. It's just, no, this solves a problem. We will do it, you know. And that's kind of how the military works. You could, you know, regardless of your position, you can be reassigned in a minute to do something something else. Um, the code talkers are mentioned a lot in newspapers and particularly in the autobiographies of officers, non-Indian officers. Many of them write about using them. Uh, there's uh, four or five different officers just in the 36th alone. Uh, Joseph Oklahoma is, is an individual that for a long time he has been, and he has been recognized as a code talker, but uh, recently we've come into some documentation that, yeah, he was in the unit. He was in some um, uh, particularly uh, dangerous and um, accelerating and bravery actions that won him, rightly so, won him the awards he did. Uh, but we have found out later that he was not used as a code talker. Whether he might have been in that group of 19 or not, it's possible. But we simply, again, don't have a, a smoking gun there and everything. But no, no formal U.S. government recognition at this time. The Army remains aware of code talkers and what they are. Now, we've been throwing that term around a lot, code talkers, but the actual term code talker will not develop until 1944 in the Marine Corps. And so at this time, they're just called Indian talkers uh, or Indians, you know, used on the radio, et cetera. There's no really like specific term for them, but for uh, reference sake, we just generically refer to everybody doing this as a, as a code talker, which is understood now. Um, how have they been recognized? And so this is a, a, lot, a lot of recent things. So some of the tribes themselves began doing things uh, after many decades, realizing, you know, these men did do something very unique, very special, and, and had an impact. No question about it, it had an impact. So the Choctaws, like them, they begin to erect some monuments that have special dedications to some of their code talkers and naming them. Uh, they made their own Medal of Valor uh, for the families. At this time, there were <clears throat> Most of these gentlemen were gone, but made medals of valor that were presented from the tribe to the uh, uh, to the uh, families and everything. Uh, this is an event in '89, and this is the event that really got me on this on this trail when I started graduate school in Oklahoma. Um, the, the French government representatives and the state of Oklahoma went together at the Oklahoma State Capitol 
and had a special recognition of the Comanche and Choctaw code talkers of World War I and II. And so this is the last surviving code, Choctaw code talker of World War II. And there were three Comanches uh, still present at this time in, in, in World War II. All the World War I gentlemen were gone by this time. Uh, but it was very well received by, by the Choctaws, by the Comanches, and by the public in general. Uh, and what this did is, I would say it's a little bit of a spark, a little bit of tinder um, in the dry grass that began to uh, burn and caught people's attention. And other groups said, well, hey, you know, we had some code talkers and we need to, you know, we need to explore this more. We need to do something to recognize these uh, men and everything. So in... Um, 2002, I started working with uh, some of the Comanche code talkers around 92 or so, and I interviewed the last four of them, uh, their training officer, and then I, I even found uh, fellow soldiers, non-Indians, that were partners with some of these guys on things uh, that had survived and were still alive. And so I came out with this book that it has a introductory chapter, a little bit on World War One, and then on World War II. Um, that came out in 2002, was well received. Um, I did not necessarily have an idea that I would do something beyond this. I have lots of, of projects, you know, over the years and things. Um, shortly after that book came out, about a year or so, I got a phone call in my office one day, and it said that it was uh, such and such from the office of Senator Tom Daschle. And um, uh, that was surprising, you know, it's obviously surprising. And they asked me, they said, could you come up to Washington, D.C.? We're having a Senate committee hearing. Um, you're the academic person on this. There's nobody else that, that does this. And, and uh, we would like you to present any and all information you have on all Native American code talkers. So I was thrilled because I thought, you know, here's somebody's going to get some good out of this project. And if I've got something to share, I am more than happy, you know, to do it. So this is the uh, Greg Pyle, the chief of the Choctaw Nation, Melvin Kirchy Jr., uh, vice chairman of the Comanche. There were Ho-Chunks, there were Lakotas, there was other people there, a few people I already knew, uh, a lot of new acquaintances, and we all each had 15 minutes to present our, uh, our material and everything of that nature. Um, so I always joke and tell people that was, I have, I have my name and Southwest Missouri State at the time for 15 minutes on C-SPAN. My 15 minutes of fame were gone right then and everything, but it's a, it's a, it's a fun observation, you know. Um, what this did is, again, more people heard about it. Uh, the committee was very receptive. Uh, there were veterans on the committee, some really important ones too. Um, and so, again, a grassroots movement growing, 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 and growing. And so it took four years of legislation attempts, but finally, um, uh, President Bush signed off this. Dan, Dan Bourne from Oklahoma took it in and actually interrupted a meeting in about the last 15 minutes and, and got uh, President Bush to sign this uh, before it lapsed. So in 2008, the Code Talker Recognition Act was passed. What this did, uh, it, it provides a federal law now that in 2000, uh, the Navajos were recognized with a Congressional Gold Medal. And so what this does is it gives equal recognition and equal award to all the other Native American code talkers and everything. And of course, a lot of these go back much earlier than the Navajos. So you can imagine the communities, the families, of course, uh, were, were thrilled you know, to have this. So this finally passed in, in 2008. And the greatest reward I got was... Um, a Lakota friend of mine and a Comanche friend of mine called me. They were lobbying up there one day and they lobbed me. And they said, they said, guess what? We're all up here lobbying. And I said, what? And they said, what do you think the Choctaws are doing? And I said, well, they're probably talking to everybody they can. They said, they have, um, they have bags of your books and they're going office to office and giving them to the senators and the reps and everything. And I, I thought that, that I was so happy because, you know, it, it, can, it can make a difference, you know. And so uh, a lot of research and preparation once the, uh, the act was passed. This is uh, Judy Allen, I still work with, and then Greg Powell in the Choctaw Nation. And uh, over a period of five years, um, medals were designed. And at first, the Treasury was just going to design a generic single model. And the tribe said, no, we will design our own with you. So the Mint oversaw the process, but the tribes came up with the patterns they wanted, 
the symbols, the iconography, et cetera. And so in 2013, I went back up. This is uh, um, Constitution Hall downstairs. Um, so 33 tribes were recognized this day. 25 of them received their medals uh, that day. Uh, eight others were still in design production. So each tribe received one gold medal. And those medals are typically like in the tribal museum or some kind of you know, very uh, special situation. Uh, each family received one silver medal. So each of the families, and then the family decides who will curate it and do that. And then there are bronze ones that are open to the public for anyone can purchase them or uh, uh, acquire them and everything. And so here's just uh, some of the designs in black and white, the Choctaw medal. But um, the, you know, many of these things, a lot of them have uh, statements in their own language about uh, the code talking. They have sometimes clan symbols, tribal symbols. So things that really, really uh, relate to their, uh, like their, their national flag or their tribal symbology. And then here's just uh, the Choctaw medal, the Cherokee, uh, Oklahoma Cherokee medal, and then the uh, Comanche medal and everything to show you what some of them look like. Uh, this is uh, the Choctaw Nation, and uh, there's Dan Bourne with them, but getting their gold medal. So I, I uh, wanted to get some good pictures of that. I filmed it and photographed it both, and then uh, ended up writing an article on the, uh, I wrote an article on the passage of the act, and then I also um, did one on the gold medal ceremony and silver medal ceremony. And uh, I'm going to provide those to Mr. Perry later. If anyone is interested, they can, uh, they can get them or they can email me. Uh, these are three of the people that worked a lot with me on this over the years. Robin Roberts is from the Meskwakis. Andrea is Lakota. Don is, is uh, actually Dakota and not Lakota. Um, but Don is the uh, uh, former president, the, um, the uh, National Native American Veterans Association for the whole country. He was the uh, uh, director of that for several years, but a uh, Korean War veteran, very active in uh, helping get the code talkers uh, recognized. Uh, you're starting to see museum displays, even, you know, starting small, but this is at the World War I Museum in Kansas City. So what we're seeing is, you know, I can remember a time where you never saw anything out in the public about a code talker and the awareness of the education is, is increasing. And there's many, many, many people that contribute to this, you know. So the Choctaws have made their own uh, documentary film um, and, and things in the community. So we're starting to see things like that. Um, the Choctaws have a Code Talker Association, which I belong to as an associate member and, uh, you know, kind of help them with research and things. And so this is a really, really wonderful lady, good friend of mine, uh, Nunchina Shoba. Uh, she's the president of the association. And this is her holding a picture of her great grandfather, who was one of the Choctaw Code Talkers. And then this is the association uh, emblem. So the uh, eight, eight lightning bolts for the eight code talkers, the 36th division patch, et cetera. Um, there's been a lot of things in terms of signage. So there is now a bridge uh, in Southeastern Oklahoma, uh, typically near where each code talker grew up and was raised, but a bridge name for each of the uh, Choctaw code talkers. There is an official Choctaw Code Talker Highway now uh, between Antlers and uh, Broken Bow. Um, the uh, uh, statue and everything was modeled off of one of the Choctaw's um, uh, photos and things of that nature. So we're starting to see a lot of that kind of awareness. The, the Comanches have done the same thing. And so they have a, a statue, a spirit talker, which is, is uh, it has the World War II guys on this side, the World War I co-talkers on the other side, but it's a, a kind of a, a, a whirlwind or a turning into an old warrior who's leaning over the shoulder and, and almost as if whispering to one of the co-talkers uh, at Utah Beach in World War II. And then they have a highway that they've uh, recently named. So there's a lot of awareness. The, the, the Hopis have this out west. The Navajos have it for, for their World War II programs. And, but uh, the World War I groups are also getting some attention. Um, so to kind of, you know, wind some of this up, these are independent programs. Uh, there's nothing overarching in the military that said, you know, do this in all these groups. They were independent uh, 
uh, ways to solve the same basic problem. Uh, they're generally similar in formation in that people just use their local native languages. And then even later, when they do develop code words, it'll mostly be on just things that are everyday, familiar to them, things about their culture, their home area, uh, et cetera, and everything. The advantages of code talking is the speed and the security. So by the time we get to World War II, there's cases of where um, it takes about a minute and a half to send and receive and translate one of these messages and write it back down into English and hand it off. Whereas if you are actually encrypting um, with machinery, uh, some of these messages can take an hour and a half to uh, close to three to send, uh, decode, and actually get implemented. So um, the enemy literally did not have time to react. You could get things uh, called for immediately. None of the codes are broken. Um, there are multiple cases of Germans inquiring what the languages were. That was never revealed. And, and uh, there's said to be, you know, quite a few chuckles and laughs at, at that, that question. But it was, uh, it was not told to them and everything. Uh, again, no indication that tribes were ordered to uh, keep the program secret. And we just have a wealth of, of newspaper and military accounts and things. So um, in hindsight, it probably should have been. You know, it would have been more secure. Um, but we'll use it again in World War II, and, and again, the enemy still doesn't have the ability to, uh, uh, to counter it at that time. So several, uh, again, several different sy uh, systems. The important part is that they set the precedent. This will be expanded upon in much larger scale um, as we head into World War II. And then this is just a chart of uh, not everybody, but many of the World War II groups that I've uh, researched and work with. Some of them I've been able to interview the last members in, and some of it is more archival, and uh, depending on who is uh, still available. Uh, but some of the groups uh, are as small as two men being found in a situation and then uh, put them at opposite ends. And that gives you, uh, you could have front line, you could have something back to regiment or battalion, but it gives you a, a very secure line of communication that can then be handed off in, in English. And many groups across the country, the Southwest, the Plains, the Northeast, the Southeast, et cetera, even Canadian Cree who were used in uh, our uh, Eighth American Air Force in London to run bombing runs uh, in Cree and Algonquin in World War II. So last year I came out with this. Uh, it, it's the uh, first volume that's ever uh, really approached all the World War uh, one groups and everything, and I'm currently working on the World War II book. It's, it's, I can't say when it'll be out. I'm, I'm over the hump. I'm probably 80% there, but there's still some groups. With about 30 groups, I've still got some archival work I've got to uh, do before I would uh, uh, even attempt to conclude it and everything, but it, it, it will come, you know, and it's a great joy to do the work. It's, it's, it's so pleasurable. And there's still still more research to be done. I've identified two World War I groups and a World War II group that have not yet been recognized by Congress. And I hope to eventually help them get the equal uh, recognition. So again, thank you so much for, for uh, tuning in and your attention. And I will be more than happy uh, for any questions that you have. Right now, if you have questions, uh, please uh, do uh, pass them over. Use the question and answer icon, please. Uh, we did have two comments. Uh, first one was from Barry. He talked about a third of the population, if you maybe want to comment on. Uh, we're not citizens until the citizen, uh, Indian yes. Citizen Act of 1924. Yes. So a lot of yes. these uh, uh, Native Americans who en enlisted did so voluntarily, not as citizens. Yes, uh, and that's a tricky thing. It, a lot of it come down to whether your reservation was allotted or not, if you went through the process of allotment. So yeah, there are some individuals that are actually, that volunteer, that are not citizens. And there's also individuals who are drafted who are not citizens, but agree to go ahead and, and uh, serve and everything. And so yeah, that, that's a very... Um, it's a very complex question. And it was confusing for both draft boards, non-Indians, and then even some Indian groups. There were unclear about whether certain communities, are they citizens, are they not? And uh, so in 1919, they offered citizenship to all Native American veterans 
who served in World War I, but the process was very difficult and bureaucratic. And so most of them didn't, and it was also difficult to get to those offices. So most of them did not follow up on that. Uh, so in 1924, Blanket Citizenship with the Indian Citizenship Act um, makes all natives uh, now citizens and put the put the question to rest. But yeah, absolutely, there were guys that were wounded and killed that were not citizens. This question comes from Victoria. She what what reparations are being made to the reservations and tribal councils, and were Indigenous veterans financially recognized, such as others? Yes, and, and again, uh, this is one of the things, because a lot of these communities are particularly back in those days, even a even little bit more isolated, but it's still a, an issue today in some of your more Western, more rural communities. Do you have a VA hospital that's within practical distance that you can get to? And so there, there has been over the years uh, uh, an increase of some of those types of services and clinics trying to make it more accessible to people. Uh, but yeah, basically today veterans have, uh, Native veterans have the exact same VA benefits that they can apply for and uh, uh, as any other veteran and everything. Uh, but there's a lot of folks in World War I that did not really seek them out or, or really get much for it and everything. In terms of reparations, that, that I'm doing a whole course on kind of that that stuff next semester, but uh, depending on your uh, depending on your particular treaty and the provisions, there might be there may be certain amounts of payment that go to that uh, the tribe on a yearly basis, which is used for social services to run some of the tribal government, etc. So that can be very very different in amount, in frequency, everything from community to community. Uh, that's something that is very difficult to generalize about. Uh, sort of a crazy question. Um, did uh, you find any indication that some of these code talkers or some of the, the Native Americans participated in the bonus marches? Hmm. I don't know. I've never seen that raised, but that would that, that's an excellent question and everything. But I've never I've never seen that that uh, question raised and everything. So uh, this question or it's more it was a more of a comment, but I think it's a question for the general audience. Could you talk about the white soldiers' attitudes towards some of the Native Americans they were serving with? Yeah, um, there's what we call the uh, uh, Tom Holm. Tom Holm is a Cherokee Muscogee. He's a retired professor from Arizona. Um, and uh, he coined the term, he's a Vietnam veteran, he coined the term the Indian Scout Syndrome. And so uh, for the most part, there is the, the idea in World War I, of course, where natives were primarily integrated into the units. There were, there were requests by both native communities and also by some Anglo military leaders to form all Indian companies or battalions or regiments. Uh, the government didn't agree to that for a couple reasons. Uh, one, it, it didn't facilitate their larger goal of mixing them in with the populace and, uh, and assimilating. But two, um, some of these communities are so small that replacing those people uh, is is almost difficult. The numbers of those people from specific communities is not practical uh, from a military standpoint. And so that was not followed up. But most of the accounts, if you look at them, uh, natives are very, or non-natives are typically very curious, of course. Of course, they have some stereotypes and things like that. Uh, everybody's referred to as chief, regardless of whether your tribe even had chiefs or, or you know, acknowledge it. Um, but most of it is that there is this, uh, this Indian scout syndrome where there is the non-Indian belief, widespread held belief that natives have uh, basically biologically innate uh, military ability, can see farther in the dark, can walk quieter through the woods, you know, uh, can do all these kind of things. Um, and so I've had many natives, you know, dispel that over the years. And they said, you know, yeah, we have some people that are extremely tough and don't, you know, bear up to anything. And then we had other guy, other native guys that just couldn't, you know, couldn't do this. So it's a, it's a very strong stereotype. The danger of the stereotype I think the seriousness of it is that a lot of times natives were picked to be scouts, recon, point men, uh, to do more dangerous positions. So that put you in contact with fire and the enemy. And so you do have, unquestionably, you have a higher native wound and killed in action rate in World War I than the mainstream population. So um, based, based on the size of, of the native population. 
Did you find any indication that uh, Native Americans then continued their service so they could retire and get a pension? Uh, say that again. Did you find any indication that uh, Native Americans that maybe enlisted during World War I or drafted during World War I then continued to serve in the Army, eventually being able to retire and get a pension? Uh, it would not surprise me if there's some that did, but it, that becomes much more common after World War II and Korea and Vietnam. And, you know, today there is, uh, particularly with the actions in the Middle East, there was a, uh, a, a real noticeable swell of uh, Native servicemen again, and not just Native men, but also Native women. I interviewed a lot of Native women veterans last summer down in Oklahoma. And uh, so uh, increasingly more and more people are aware of that. And again, there's many factors here. Um, depending on some tribes really celebrate veterans. And so that is an important part of your social status, your community recognition. Others uh, don't celebrate being a veteran at all. It's very hush hush and everything. Some people come from uh, families just like in non-Indian families where you have had veterans back till you know the beginning of time. And so that's tradition. It's a part of the culture, part of the family culture. Um, you have uh, some who, uh, some natives in their exit interviews in World War I described where they went to escape the conditions of the reservations. Um, some went because of the employment opportunity. And then some went just for the, their young men and young men went on exploratory journeys often. And so there's, depending on which veteran you talk to, you could get two, three, four, or sometimes five or six of those factors for an individual veteran. Did the ones that left from the school, did you see any indication they went back to school or, or did they just go back? Uh, there's, a little, there's a little bit of both. There are some that went and finished. Uh, of course, they finished at a little bit later age, of course. Um, but there's also a lot of these that like, uh, like there's a lot of them that had just graduated boarding school or like maybe had been out a year and everything. And when, and when the war come up and then part of that was also seen, like uh, I think it's the Onondaga, there's, there's a few other tribes, but they formally declare war on Germany themselves. They see themselves as a sovereign nation. And they say, you know, you've tacked America, but you've also tacked us. So we are, we as the Onondaga nation are declaring war on you ourselves, which I, th I think that's just, that's just excellent. I mean, how patriotic, you know. Um, and so um, there's a lot of people that saw that as an attack on, on uh, this continent and it had to be defended. So I always explain it um, when I talk to students, I said, think of it in terms of like dual citizenship. Some people have dual citizenship with England and the United States. Okay, for a native person here, if you're a federally recognized tribe, you have membership and you recognize that tribe, you have federal, you know, uh, congressionally recognized membership in that sovereign nation. So you're protecting your land bases, that tribe and your community, your culture, your people, but you're also a U.S. citizen. So simultaneously, whether designed or not, you're also serving, you know, protecting everyone else's here in the land, you know. Now, most veterans would tell you the tribe and everything is their first emphasis, naturally. You know, uh, but it's really kind of a dual service, which I think is is uh, unique. We do not have that same kind of situation here for other populations. Last question. Um, this is from Elsie. Uh, Elsie wants to know uh, how different were the languages of the tribe? We talked yesterday about sign language, but how, how different was the actual languages? Um, so you have several major language families in North America. So um, I'll give you some examples a little bit like from World War II. There's a group of seven uh, Lakotas who are pulled together from six different reservations. It's, it's uh, dialects of all the same language. They have accents and things, but they can all easily understand everybody. Just like if we had somebody from Australia and somebody from England and somebody from South Africa, we'd have no trouble. So some languages are very broad and there's dialects. There's others where there's not a word a shared word together at all. So they can be as different as English and Japanese. Okay. So depending on, depending on the language family and the group involved, you could have somebody who's very, very similar, um, mutually intelligible, or you could have somebody where you don't share a word, you know. Well, I wanna thank you for a, a great talk tonight. Uh, my indication always is how well you hold the audience and you didn't lose a single person during the entire presentation. So I guess you truly did engage uh, 
the, the folks who showed up. We will be posting this uh, up onto our YouTube site here in the next couple of days. So please let your friends know about it. And because this is a talk that really needs to be heard. Okay. Uh, I would like to invite you here next week, not next week, uh, I think in two weeks, I have uh, Brigadier General retired Leon Johnson from the US Air Force. He's gonna stay in World War I. He's gonna talk about Eugene Bow, the first African-American pilot. So we we'll, uh, hope you come back next week. Dr. Meadows, hopefully someday you're here in Carlisle and we can, we can dig through the archives and, uh, and see what else we might be able to find for you, okay?